Good morning. This is the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals Public Review Session for October 20th, 2014. We'll begin with the special order calendar decision items. Item number one, 30201 BZ, 2519 Creston Avenue, the Bronx. Okay, uh, I don't think there were any issues left with this. Um, happily, the applicant provided the metal picket fence, which I hope will be installed very quickly. Um, any other comments? Item number two, 15207BZ, 8701 4th Avenue, Brooklyn. I don't think there are any issues with this one. No. New cases. Item number three, 72456BZ, 4242 Francis Lewis Boulevard, Queens. Okay. Um, so this is an application to amend the length of an extension of term on the automotive repair. Um, the, the question had to do with um, the, tow, the tow truck uh, parking, and we just want an uh, affidavit from the owner uh, indicating that there will be no, no tow truck operations or, say, a business operating there that is a tow truck business. Um, I understand that the tow trucks um, must drop the cars off, but it shouldn't be that that's where the tow truck operation is going from. Um, but there did seem to be a lot of support for the application from neighbors. They got 324 signatures from supporting neighbors. Um, what I didn't see is whether the community board provided a recommendation. Do we have that yet? I don't know where. Don't, not, so if the app could stir that up quickly for us, that would be great. Uh, I would, I'd like to know whether there was any opposition to this use as opposed to all those great signatures. Um, and also the statement of facts and the compliance report doesn't mention the conditions um, of the prior uh, 2012 grant, uh, which were also supposed to be listed on the certificate of occupancy. So that needs to be added to the certificate of occupancy. But if you could go through the conditions uh, and indicate whether they've been complied with one by one, um, and in particular the compliance with the C2C um, uh, zoning regulations for signage. Um, I, I have there's a list of of the 2012 and the 2004 grant um, conditions um, that I took directly off of the approvals that the. Uh, the parking on site will be limited to vehicles awaiting service and other commercial or overnight parking is prohibited. So that would go for the tow trucks. That a no parking sign be installed and maintained on the fence. That signage is limited to what's shown on the approved plans in 2012. Um, and that the conditions be listed on the certificate of occupancy. And then in uh, 2004, the grant said that any graffiti located on the premises shall be removed within 24 hours, that automotive repair work shall be conducted entirely within the enclosed building, that there be no automatic car wash at the site, that landscaping be installed and maintained according to the plans, that all fencing shall be 100% opaque, that all lighting shall be directed downwards and away from any adjacent residential uses, that no auto body or welding <coughs> work is conducted at the site, but actually I think that's been changed since. Um, so, uh, it, so those issues should be addressed on the application. Uh, other comments? Um, you know, I just saw when I went to the site within the garbage enclosure, there's actually a shed. So is that shed the way in which they're storing garbage inside or is that shed used for storage or something else? Just curious. Mm -hmm. Any other? I did visit the site. Actually, I was there in the evening, and there were no trucks. Oh, okay. And the site, you know, looked acceptable to me. Mm-hmm. Okay. And there were no tow trucks. Okay. Anything else? Okay. okay. Item number four, 36203BZ, 428 West 45th Street, Manhattan. Sorry, one second. Okay. Um... So this is a special permit, I mean, sorry, an extension of term for the continued operation of an accessory commercial open parking lot and storage shed. Um, I guess uh, some of the issues have to do with what was approved versus what we see. 
Uh, the 2004 approval allowed a 16-foot curb cut and required a six-foot high chain link fence between the lot and the residential property to the east. Instead, there's a 24-foot curb cut with a four-foot high fence that functions like a cage over what looks like weeds as opposed to planting. Um, and there are down lights, which are floods facing down for security on the sidewall of the adjoining of the commercial, a sidewall of the adjoining commercial building. Um, so the applicant should really discuss if this is, um, if, if these, this is an effort to sort of legalize those conditions because the drawings are not at all consistent with that. The existing condition drawing shows a six foot high chain link fence and no lighting. And also um, the previously approved drawings show a 10 foot curb cut, not the 16 foot curb cut as stated in the statement of findings. So the application really needs to be cleaned up and made consistent. Um, and any other comments on that? I just had a question about the um, the shed that's on the site. They state that uh, no no chemicals are are in the shed, but they don't exactly tell us what is in the shed. So um, if they could clarify that for me, that would be great. Um, I, I was curious as to the operation of the site. How do the cars maneuver in and out because it's quite narrow? Are they backing into the lot is my big question. And also, it looked to me when I went there that there were more than six cars and they were parked very haphazardly and they were parked alongside the residential. So it seems to me it would be better if there was some sort of striping to direct the cars against the adjacent commercial building that they're accessory to rather than right under the windows of the residential property. Mm -hmm. okay. I just don't see the need for the 24 foot curb cut. You know, I, I felt you know, a 10 to 13 foot curb cut would be adequate. Okay. okay. Item number five, 32706 BZ, 133 East 58th Street, Manhattan. It's the PCE. Okay. Um, this is a special permit for the a PCE, uh, Velocity Performance Sports. Um, my comments were mostly about the application and its, its clarity. The statement of facts um, has an incorrect reference to the hours of operation. It refers only to the peak weekday hours. Uh, two times. Each one is contradictory, so that needs to be corrected. Um, the drawings indicate, don't indicate whether the uh, fire alarms were actually connected to the fire department uh, and whether the sprinkler systems were installed uh, according to the approved drawings from 2004, so that needs to be clarified. And the, there needs to be a fire safety narrative that was not provided. And again, the compliance report needs to list the conditions of the prior approval and indicate whether the site is in compliance with, with those. Um, any other comments? I didn't see the standard BSA plans, but notes on the plans. And um, I agree the um, fire safety measures. And they have rooms called treatment rooms. It wasn't clear to me what was being offered in the treatment rooms. And if it's massage, since they're operating, they should give us licenses. I go? Mm -hmm. Okay. Appeals calendar decision items, item number 6, 5709A, 11209A through 12909A and 15209A. Santa Monica Lane, El Camino Loop, Moreno Court, Staten Island. <clears throat> okay. um, I didn't actually have any additional comments on this. Does anyone else? Mm -hmm. Item number 7, 2314A, uh, 19835, 51st Avenue, Queens. I also don't have any comments on this. Anyone? No? Continued hearing items, item number eight and item number nine, 638 East 11th Street, Manhattan. The applicant has requested an adjournment. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. um, building department, I believe it's fine with that adjournment. Okay. Mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll adjourn it. Yeah. That's They're fine. asking for November 25th, but I don't know. November 25th? 25th. We'll clarify with yeah. the applicant. Are they planning to be here tomorrow to clarify? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. New cases, item number 10, 1114. Wait, through, I'm sorry. What happened to 107.13? 
You call both. We usually call both, both of them together. The oh, oh, at the same time. I'm one sorry. is the building department application. One is the application. Oh, I see. Okay. New cases, item number 10, 1114A through 1414A, 198th Street, Queens. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the, this is a extension of time to complete or really a common law vested right to continue development under um, the prior zoning in the R3-2 zoning district. Um, I know the community board voted to disapprove of that, so interested in their concerns um, and one of their concerns was that um, or the original plans um, had called which were pursuant to the prior zoning had relied on some type on fire department access which is no longer a part of the project and um, we don't know what it is they're referring to so uh, it said it was to rely on adjacent property for access but that property was never acquired. So what is what is the fire department access now? We would like the fire department please to comment on this. Um, I have sent it to the fire department. Okay. We are looking at it. Okay. Um, and then the other, then if the applicant could just comment on that apparent non-complying condition of the buildings as built where there's some problem with the the prior zoning yard compliance and the parking, where there was a modification to the buildings that is now proposed, or there's actually removing a portion of two of the sidewalls, um, that should be discussed in the in the statement of facts. And also, in general, the drawings are very unclear, as is the zoning chart, about what is complying and what is non-complying with current zoning. So we really do need to understand what that the impact of the rear yard is, not just to say that if this followed rear yard regulations, the building couldn't would have to be demolished, but exactly how is it not complying that show that on the drawings and um, make that clear in the zoning analysis. Um, and I know that there were other comments on this. Yeah. Um, I had comments about uh, one of the findings, which is concerning the amount of money that was spent. Um, I know it's going to be difficult for them to quantify that because the prior owner made the expenditures and they don't have the proof of expenditures, but they do have a new owner who purchased it and purchased it almost complete, because right now it's almost complete. So if they could give us what they would assume out of the purchase price, pertains to the improvement on the lot, that can at least help give us an idea of the amount of money that was spent on the property and also would give us an indication of the serious loss provided all of that improvement has to be demolished. And I agree with you, it is not clear exactly what would have to be demolished and could they get away with cutting back part of the building and then rebuilding an exterior wall or does the entire thing, all four buildings have to be completely demolished and then rebuilt. Mm -hmm. So, it'd be so just to understand that, so it would be isolating the cost of unimproved land and just from subtracting it out of the purchase price out so of that the purchase we could price. see what the okay. money that would represent the improved part mm -hmm. would be. So, okay. Any other comments on this? Um, it seemed that they were um, vested when the rezoning occurred. But then the permits lapsed two years after the rezoning, and they went to the buildings department and got a PAA, which was approved, and the permits were reissued. So can they explain what was in the PAA? And you know, that permit reissuement was incorrect. Mm -hmm. okay. So what did the PAA really change in terms of the original vested plans? Okay. And was work done pursuant to pursuant the PAA? To those, that PAA, right? Okay. Okay. Any other comments? No. Oh, thanks. Item number 11, 162, 14A, 100 Geigerich Avenue, Staten Island. Okay. Um, this is a uh, general city law, section 36, request to build in a legally mapped street. Um, the, I, I note that there are many other approvals on, on, 
for a building in the bed of Gagrich Avenue. Um, the fire department had some comments on this, which should be added to the drawings. Um, the proposed two, it's the comments are, the proposed two-story, one-family dwelling must have a sprinkler system installed throughout the entire premises, and a serviceable fire hydrant must be located within 250 feet of the main front entrance of the subject property, and if that doesn't exist, then the owner is, has to make sure that that is installed. Um, any other comments on this? I just had a question for, uh, for the fire department, I guess, also um, whether or not they were satisfied with the configuration of, I guess it's sort of the dead end turnaround at, at um, sort of the back of the street there, um, whether they have enough uh, turning radius, and I'm wondering if they took a look at that as well. And this is a through lot, and I was just wondering, you know, Give, give us a good reason why they don't front on Bethel Avenue, which wouldn't require the GCL 36. Mm -hmm. okay. Item number 12, 163.14a through 165.14a, Canal Street, Manhattan. Ah, interesting. This is a very interesting one. It's a... Uh, um, asking, uh, requesting a waiver, uh, essentially, of the floodplain regulations that require that the building be built um, above the established floodplain level. Um, because this is three buildings located in historic district and um, the buildings are, uh, their entry is at grade without much of a stoop or very small stoop, um, the request is to not be required to raise the entrance to the building um, and then and, and essentially compensate for the floodplain regulations by installing temporary floodgates. Um, I personally had a lot of trouble with this application, it, mostly because um, of reading in depth the, uh, the specifications for the aquafence that was provided, um, where these are temporary panels that are installed I assume in front of the building itself, actually on a city sidewalk, and the, the entire test depended on the panels being installed where it took something, it took 15 man hours to install this barrier, and um, which, it, which did not include running back and forth to the hardware store to get all the missing parts or getting the right tools and so on. And so in the first place, this idea of spending between 10 and 15 hours to install this in an emergency when the city is in a state of chaos. Um, so like Sandy, we, saw it, we experienced it so recently. So everyone's supposed to be evacuating and the landlord here, or the applicant here who will be the landlord, is representing that during all that hysteria, he's going to have five guys come and uh, either drill anchor holes down into the sidewalk, which is city property, which he doesn't have the right to do, or those, bar those anchors will already be in the sidewalk, and let's just hope, let's say, there's no storm like Sandy for another five years, so those anchors are installed now, and in five years you can't find them because they're either missing or filled with junk and they can't be used anymore, so the anchors are nowhere to be found, so you really do need five guys with 15 hours and a supervisor from Aquafence if they're still in business in five years. And so that whole mechanism seems really unreasonable in particular because it's the landlord doing it as opposed to the owner of the property whose place it is that's about to be wrecked by the storm. Um, and then there were statements in the application that said that uh, these levels are living rooms of rental tenants and that there won't be any furnishings or valuables at these levels. So I don't really understand that because my living room has, is where all my valuables are. So it's like, so the flood comes and that really nice rug that you spent too much money on is wrecked in the storm and um, if the floodgates don't really work. So uh, it's sort of a strange statement to have made because these are rental tenants who won't know that they're supposed to keep everything elevated from the floor about three feet. Um, so it's, it's sort of like a lack of sense here in this application. And, um, and, I, and then I go to look at, um, and, and also the way the floodgates are being described, it seems like it's the front of the building that's going to be floodproofed, 
not the rear of the building. Um, and now if it's in the rear of the building, even more work and interesting how you're going to install that. And what about, what about adjoining the property to the sides? I mean, are there other ways of water penetrating? Is there a cellar here uh, that's also a source for water to flow? Um, and um, there's so many questions about this. And then the, the next question is, for example, this is not that much lower. The, the grade is not that much lower than flood elevation. I don't have the exact number here, but I think it's like two and a half feet or something. And so what I don't understand is if, you, if the applicant wants to keep the front door at grade where it is right now or slightly above grade, why can't there be a little vestibule when you come in and then you go up some steps and you arrive at that at the elevated level, um, I'm assuming that this is a gut renovation so that you can adjust for floor heights and for the information of the applicant, the Landmarks Commission often approves the raising of roof roofs to accommodate that top floor's lack of floor to floor height. So uh, this was uh, approved with a certificate of no effect, which indicates only interior work, but it seems to me that this could be accomplished in a way that would meet the floodplain regulations and protect the tenants and be a reasonable solution. Other comments? <laughs> I, I absolutely agree with everything that you've said. Um, I just feel that to rely on sort of the human factor um, to protect this building in a timely manner is, is probably um, uh, not a very good idea. In an emergency situation, you've got all sorts of things happening. Um, you, you cannot rely necessarily on, on your forces to get there um, if they're not in the area. If they're coming from someplace else, you now have to rely on them to actually get to the site to then perform the 10 to 17 hours worth of work, which you know I think is significant. I also had questions um, about they've got a, a crawl space slash cellar, and it's not clear to me um, whether they have looked at what happens if you know there's a breach uh, and water now gets into the cellar. They don't really tell us um, uh, where the utilities come in and at what elevation they are, they are at. They have cooking on the first floor, which tells me that there's gas coming into to the building at that level. Um, so and, and of course water. So I, I have questions about exactly um, why they would not want to elevate that first floor or if they feel that they can't use that first floor for storage or something that does not necessarily mean that you have are going to lose a utility in some way. Um, let that second floor become your sort of main living floor. Um, so questions about that are questions about where they say their safe haven is. It's in the back of the building on a rooftop that is not um, uh, covered in any way, so you're you're asking people if it's a bad storm. You're asking people to sort of muster there, and who knows how long they would be there. Um, and there's really no way out of that backyard to um, you know, for someone to be rescued. So that that was an issue. Um, and I just also had questions about um, their foundation, the current foundation. We had Sandy, and and clearly I imagine the foundations have been affected by that, and I'm wondering if um, they've looked at the foundations to see if it, they could withstand, you know, additional, um, an additional flood, and for how long um, those, um, those foundation walls would be underwater. So I have a lot of questions about the system. Mm -hmm. Well, I also have a few questions. I mean, they state that they're only going to install this upon a government warning for an impending flood, but they don't really say what they're going to do for flash flooding, which could be just as damaging when you're at grade. And um, it said it's going to take many hours, but it, they don't really go into detail as to where they're actually storing the material because it could take even more than the many hours that they're assessing for this if they have to go to a remote area to get this. And um, I wasn't clear about whether or not they actually tested it on this site to see how long it was going to take to install on this site for these three buildings, because they're relatively small. Is it still going to take 15 hours or a dozen hours, or is it actually quicker so they could provide that information? That would be helpful. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think um, well, one of my con big concerns was they didn't have any kind of engineered drawings to show how things were going to be installed, how they were going to do the enclosures, and as you mentioned earlier, how they were going to handle the rear of the property. And they don't have a developed safety plan, which itemizes what would occur <coughs> at what point in time and who would be responsible for doing things. Um, I think if you intend to supply these types of uh, flood-proofing panels, you're required to have a certificate that someone will be responsible, such as an engineer or an architect, for storing them, knowing where they are, and installing them. And they have to sign off on that. But all in all, I think their easiest way of handling this is just to make the first floor either uh, accessory to residential or retail. And then they wouldn't need a waiver at all. Well, it was retail. That's yes. part of the problem. Return it to right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Or raise the floor. That's another way to do it, especially if it's a gut renovation. They're already removing joists. So. Um, okay. Uh, I think that was... Yes, that was it. Good. Item number 13, 235-14A, 4020 Atlantic Avenue, Brooklyn. Okay, this is part of the Build It Back program. Um, construction on a... Oh, for um, a Section 36 access on an unmapped street. Um, I didn't have any comments on this. Well, it wasn't clear whether or not they had the required visual mitigation measures. They've given us a revised site plan, and they mentioned that they're going to do raised plantings with shrubs, but they don't really note that on the plan. So I think if they added that, it would be fine. Zoning calendar, decision items, item number 14, 65, 13BC, 123 Franklin Avenue, Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. I think they, um, we need to defer this decision to November. We're still waiting for materials from, I think it's from DEC. Okay, item number 15, 283, 13BC, 4930, 20th Avenue, Brooklyn. Okay, um, this one is for... Uh, PCE special permit, and we had questions about parking, and the applicant provided uh, a reasonably good parking analysis. Um, and just for future use, it'd be great if the parking analysis could also show um, when, when indicating where the parking lots are, because we see there's a parking lot that has quite a lot of spaces, um, what the empty counts are, what, how much available parking there is in each one of those locations. Um, but otherwise, I'm fine with this. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. All right. Item number 16, 5314BZ, 12 West 27th Street, Manhattan. Okay. With, with this one, the legalization of a physical cultural establishment, because there were objections to um, sanitary conditions at this, at this site, uh, and we did hear from the applicant that they have changed the, the mats so that they're not a source of odors and that there's an uh, exhaust system that was being installed. Um, we would like them to say, let's just say, be able to, we would like to be able to check on them. And so we'd like to grant this for a more limited time, um, so for a five-year grant. So we just limit it so they'll come back and show us that everything is still smooth, smoothly operating. Item number 17, 105-14-BZ, 1222 East 27th Street, Brooklyn. Um, I didn't have any comments on this. Okay. It's okay, and then all was submitted. Okay. Continued hearing items, item number 18, 155-13-BZ, 1784 East 28th Street, Brooklyn. I understood they wanted to adjourn this. Yes, that's correct. January 6th. So January 6th, okay. Item number 19, 225-13BZ, 810 Kent Avenue, Brooklyn. And this one as well was to be adjourned? I think so, yeah. Okay. Item number 20, 264-13BZ, 257 West 17th Street, Manhattan. It's a 
Uh, this is the brick CrossFit gym, mm -hmm. and the applicant has been um, rather cooperative in submitting to us a lot of the materials we asked for, in particular, or what we asked for is um, that they submit drawings and get approvals for installing um, a hung ceiling that would be sa uh, sound attenuating, and they did s and they did provide us with drawings for um, uh, two layers of gypsum and one layer of, of um, plywood hung ceiling with a very large airspace between the slab and the ceiling. Um, and I understand that they've received a permit for this. And what I'd, I'd like to hear tomorrow is where we are. And that a contractor's been secured. I'd like to hear tomorrow where we are on that. When has work started? How long is it going to take to install um, once it's once started? The other thing we got from the applicant was an affidavit from the owner saying that they are currently not dropping weights. Uh, I hope to hear tomorrow from neighbors that they that's been the case. Um, and then we are awaiting um, the, the results of their test um, that the, so, so the, there was a, sorry, the engineering report that indicated that the floating floor that they have currently is a very low floating floor. It's only an inch off, off the main slab and that as a result there is huge transmission between the slab and the floor below and the engineer recommends that the slab be floated more like three inches, three to four inches above the lower slab and use higher springs um, for that. And also, interestingly, that the slabs be broken up into 10 by 10 sections with a four inch space between them and sort of a grill between that so that things don't fall through. And then on top of that to install rubber matting and the engineer wasn't so sure about how successful that rubber matting would be because it hasn't been really tested in this application. Um, so we do need to see them actually install one of these tests um, and to hear the results of it. I do understand that they want to install the ceiling first um, before they actually make do the first test on that 10 by 10. But it, it does seem to me that they're going to be installing the same thing anyway. They might as well get started with the 10 by 10 slab now um, for that test. So once the ceiling is installed and they have a good, uh, they're ready to go with that, with that test. Um, and I think, oh, one of my comments, though, about the ceiling um, was, though, that the, the drawings show that the ceiling is separated from the sidewall with a, with a gasket that's less than an inch Deep. And it seems to me that as a result, um, or inch thick, it seems as a result when there's movement on that ceiling, there, the ceiling is actually going to hit the side wall. And so that I'd like them to talk about whether um, a larger gap along the ceiling edges is, is, ne is needed to prevent that kind of sort of hammer effect of the ceiling against the side walls. And I think... Uh, there was also some discussion about putting additional sheetrock on the walls. I'd like to get more information on what the sheetrock is. Is it that quiet rock? Is it, or how is the sheetrock going to be isolated from the, the walls themselves? Because again, that, that issue of the vibration transmitting to the side walls and then up the building and being felt by the neighbors. Other comments? Um, I, I totally agree. If, if perhaps they could tell us if there's an industry standard for the gap between the wall and and the ceiling, um, and especially what that detail looks like if they're adding sheetrock to the wall, um, you don't. I guess you don't want the the ceiling to actually touch the sheetrock. So maybe they haven't really given us the full detail on that as well. Um, and oh, their permit I think is due to expire. Uh, so if they could um, just be reminded that they need to uh, they need to renew that permit. Um, I think they've only got a couple of weeks left. So. Mm -hmm. It's probably tied to the insurance of the contractor. Uh, so. Most most assuredly, yeah. but just <laughs> as long as they know that yeah. they got to go back. Okay. Any other comments on this? Yeah. I, I just wanted to repeat one thing about the um, just the because I see that the applicant just walked in a little bit late, um, just to make sure that the um, 
that we find out what the status of the construction work is since they have a permit I assume that they're actually doing the work um, and so I'd like to hear where they are with that work okay mm -hmm. Item number 21, 327 13BZ, 1504 Coney Island Avenue. Brooklyn. So, this is an application to um, allow for the reduction in the number of required accessory parking spaces for use group four ambulatory care center. Um, the, and the, the applicant provided additional tra um, parking studies to, to show, to compare the use of this location to some other locations, so to a commercial a Marshall's department store and to understand how much parking is required for that department store and, um, and also for um, another ambulatory care facility. And I guess the, the big question is if you, if you use those two locations as comparison, those two locations are in isolation. And this particular site is a very, very congested area. So it's not completely apples to orange to apples because you, you're not looking at these as a congested area. So one of the things that we really do need to establish because we need to know that the special permit is not having a negative impact on neighborhood character, um, we, we will need traffic studies on this um, to understand how the, for instance, how the cars that are going past this garage and turning and coming out of the garage have an impact on the traffic, especially during those peak times when there's the pomegranate overflow, which apparently is mostly in Friday evenings um, or at late afternoon. Uh, and the, another question is, the applicant says that there, or the, the engineer, the, the traffic engineer, said that there are something like 69 spaces that won't be utilized for the uses in the, in the building itself, and that those would be available for overflow from uses across the street, from the pomegranate store across the street. But the question is, how will this parking garage, which is automated, distinguish between pomegranate users who are coming in, it's great, it's a great opportunity to park someplace, uh, and the accessory uses that are going to be existing in this building which need those spaces. Will there be some sort of a card that, I mean, I actually don't know how you can distinguish that. And since it's accessory to those uses, you do need to distinguish it in some way. Um, also, the, one of the findings for the special permit, or the finding for the special permit itself, is that the applicant has to establish that the ambulatory diagnostic or treatment facility is contemplated in good faith on the basis of evidence. And the materials in the application, um, including the floor plans, don't so show any evidence at all of there being an ambulatory care facility here. The floor plans show nothing on them. It's just a big, empty floor plan, so you do really need to provide the drawings for the ambulatory care facility, and I'm assuming that that tenant's already been uh, contemplated, otherwise how do you know that that's what your use is going to be? Um, so we need to have plans for that. Are there other comments? I actually visited the site on Friday, and it was closed, so I had a good chance to look at pomegranate next door. And I was very concerned because they have these two long trailers, about 40 feet long each, parked in the parking lane or the truck unloading lane permanently, um, which limits the amount of curb space where someone can pull up and, you know, get groceries into their car or something. Also, when I looked at the parking lot, there's really not 29 spaces available in pomegranate that it's more, there's a lot of area taken up with shopping carts right. and a trash receptacle and, and just storage racks, you know, for moving bread and things. So that, I would say maybe 15 spaces would be available. So I think, and when I look at over 300 people coming in an hour on a Friday and having 15 parking spaces, it, to me it's, it's really a, surprising, <laughs> overwhelming. So my big concern was that 
northbound traffic on Coney Island Avenue would attempt to turn into this parking lot. And with the storage containers in the parking lane, and people trying to, it would just, and people double park for pomegranate, it would completely stop traffic. And I just wanted some method that they would not <coughs> have any left turns into the parking area unless somehow the DOT approved a left turn lane in the median, mm -hmm. which I think would be feasible there. And might, you know, it depends on how far they are from the corner and things like that, but it might be some sort of a solution to alleviate a possible mm -hmm. worsening of the already congested situation. Right. Because, you know, all in all, it seems that they might actually alleviate some of the existing problem. So I'm not necessarily against reducing the parking, but it just seems to be the operation of how you get into the lot in relationship to the business across the street as an issue. Right. Any other comments? Yeah, I just wanted to add, what's, a, what's kind of strange about this application is the, the fact of its location opposite the pomegranate store, which is the source of all the congestion, and this application, this, the, the proposed uses aren't yet the source of the congestion, but will certainly add to them, but um, they will worsen an already terrible situation. And so because there's a request to reduce the parking, where we're potentially, um, where there's a potential that it will increase the congestion because the math is off on the calculations uh, and the, you know, there's, let's say, the department store becomes as popular as pomegranate and actually has way more traffic or more parking need than what is contemplated here. That, that's, that's the risk. And so uh, the traffic studies, which haven't been done because this is a request for a parking special permit, um, traffic studies are really necessary here because of the congested situation. And if anything, um, I, I'd actually suggest, though it's really outside of the purview of the VSA, that the applicant speak to pomegranate and see if there's some way they can work this out where, where they actually help to alleviate some of this traffic congestion by making some agreement with pomegranate to maybe rent those spaces or, or something like that. Um, you know, I, I don't know, but it, this is obviously a big problem and will delay our, the, the inability to work with what's going on across the street is kind of delaying our ability to make a real decision here because we need more information. We want to make sure we're not going to be increasing the problem. Right, so. Item number, item number 22, 328.13BZ, 8 Berry Street, Brooklyn. Uh, so um, the applicant um, gave us a revised set of drawings. Um, do we have any comments about those drawings? I've got a few, but... The existing and the future. The existing and the future. I still, I'm, I'm glad that he put the existing um, space on the drawing, but I still have an issue in that that existing space has really got to um, come up to code if you're going to use it, continue to use it as a PCE. So that would mean that the, the notes need to apply to that space in terms of fire protection. Um, you've got to tell me how you're exiting out of the space. You've got roll-up gates, um, which I do not believe are a, um, a legal means of egress out of the space. And you state that you've got enough room in there for 84 people. That will trigger a um, public assembly permit. So I understand that this is somewhat of a swing space, but um, if you're going to use it as a PCE, um, we don't have a timetable on when the building's going to get built. It could be tomorrow, it could be five or ten years from now. So um, I think the applicant is just going to have to comply. Mm -hmm. New cases, I want to, can I go? Sorry, <laughs> new cases. Item number 23, 2814BZ, 3540 Nostrand Avenue, Brooklyn. Okay, this is a um, special permit for the continued use of a McDonald's with accessory drive through. Um, the first special permit was granted in 88 and expired in 2005, so this is effectively a, a new special permit application because of the length of the expiration. Um, I just note. I, the, 
the site looks from photographs looks like it's okay except that the fence looks very ragged and um, and so that needs attention and the um, what I couldn't tell from the drawings versus the photos was uh, whether some of the windows are boarded up are they are all the windows actually there or are they no okay it's just hard to tell from the photographs okay I didn't really have any other problems with this I had a question as to what are the hours of the drive-through, mm -hmm. and also when he talks about the sound attenuation, he talks about the menu board using a particular make and model of uh, speaker microphone, but doesn't really say how it works to mitigate the sound. So if you can give us detail as to that. Is it adjusting? Sometimes they adjust based on the background noise that's going on at different times of day. It would be helpful if you could just give us details. And I just needed them to sort of clean up some of the paperwork on their sign analysis. I don't think that they actually fill in what the permitted square footage is. Um, they just tell us what they have and then says it complies. Mm -hmm. So if they could fill in that portion. Also, um, I think it's on, on their plan, but surely in their facts and findings, they mentioned that previously they had 3,245 um, square feet of floor area and the proposed is 3268. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if they've actually done some work or is that just a typo? Um, the trash location um, is different from the previously approved plans and the signage is different from previously approved plans. The pylon sign has actually got more, um, I guess, illuminated area on it than it did before and understanding that logos change, but you've got to you know, at least tell us what those changes are and whether they still comply. Um, and I also had a question about the current menu board. Is it the same one that they'd been using before or has it changed? Because um, knowing some of these, how these places operate, they will change out menu boards um, relatively regularly depending on what they're selling. Um, so, so you're talking about the 2005, the yeah. last, was that the 1988? No, it's the 2005. The 2005. Oh, okay. um, it's been a while, so it's a 10-year-old signboard. Yeah. So yeah, wondering if that's that's been changed. Um, so they have to correct um, their architect's certificate of compliance to address the, di the differences. Mm -hmm. uh, they should remove their banners. They have some banners up on the fence. And um, the fencing, I think the privacy slats need to be changed mm -hmm. because they're cracked and broken in certain places. That's what makes the fence look right. Right. Can you add? So you weave those little plastic things in one at a time? It seems like a lot of work for they instead of putting up a solid <laughs> picket. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Item number 24, 4514BZ, 337 99th Street, Brooklyn. Okay, so this is a special permit to enlarge an existing building under Section 73622. Um, and I think my first comment, which I would like the applicant to talk about, is the community board uh, voted to disapprove this because it the, the project enables the conversion of a one-family to a two-family. Um, I'm confused about why the community board actually had that response because according to the land use map that was provided, there are many two-family and multifamily buildings right adjacent across the street on the block. So not really sure what, what the community board's concern was. The other thing is um, the drawings are very confusing. There's a lot of things going on in the drawings that are not consistent from one set of drawings to the next, but one of them is that it shows the existing drawings show that there already is a single family, a unit in the basement. Um, and so it sounds more like this, this is a, an attempt to legalize that, that unit in the basement, uh, which is allowed under zoning, um, and to enlarge it at the same time. And so that should be made clear in the application. Um, the um, the DOB objection sheet um, that was provided was kind of oddly phrased. So it was, I know this is the way it used to be done, but I thought now that the Department of Buildings actually reviews the drawings. In this case, it specifically states that, um, that the 
the DOB is denying to allow the applicant to come to the BSA to get an approval under for, to enlarge a building instead of having reviewed the drawings to make sure that they comply with zoning or code or whatever. And so one of my questions is the basement unit. Is it is it a code compliant basement unit? Um, often basement units are not allowed to exist. And so um, that needs to be clarified. Um, and the applicant should submit an analysis, have the architect actually do a zoning analysis and a code analysis to show that the basement unit complies. Um, then um, with respect to the increase in floor area, which is significant, um, the applicant's requesting a, what is it, a increase in floor area to 1.24 FAR, which is significantly more than what is typically requested with these applications. That's more like in the one range. Um, and also a request to reduce the rear yard to 20 feet, which we see a lot. Um, the, 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 the plans that were, sorry, the map that was provided with the application doesn't in, in, indicate um, let's say, whether there are whether these are pre-61 non-complying buildings or whether they receive BSA special permits. It's extremely unclear about that. Um, the applicant should provide certificates of occupancy on these so that we understand whether they're pre-61 buildings. Um, the statement of facts and the, and the zoning analysis are incorrect with respect to the rear yard. The proposal reduces the rear yard at the basement level to 19 foot 9 feet from 35 foot 4 feet. The statement of facts is incorrect about both of those things. And the drawings are internally inconsistent with respect to that. Uh, there, there's also a difference in, there's an, a rear yard extension and there's also a first floor extension. There's no discussion about the difference between there. The, the difference in depth between the first floor extension and the second floor extension. Um, also, with respect to um, the impact of the building on the rear, that we, we need to see photos of the rear to show the effect of that 20-foot rear yard extension on the adjoining properties. Um, I think that those are my comments. Anybody else? Um, yeah, I, I had um, similar comments. I was concerned that um, I guess in an R4, right, they, they should have a 0.75 FAR, which would be allowable. However, they're saying that they already have a pre-existing, or they don't even actually say they have a pre-existing non-compliance. They just tell us that they have 1.05 FAR currently, and they're requesting 1.24. So I think they need to give us some backup as to why they've already started out with um, a non-compliance, maybe provide some sandborns over time that show that these buildings were this size and that there have um, been no um, additional um, additions to the building that we don't know about. Um, that would be really helpful. And I was um, confused about their reconsideration that they got from the building department. Um, they've given us uh, two versions, option one and option two. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not clear exactly which version the building department had approved. It just simply says, as per the drawing, one drawing. Mm -hmm. So um, giving, giving us two drawings um, makes us have to choose <laughs> which one they meant. And I don't want to be in that position. So they might have to go back to the building department and, and get a signature on one of those options. Yeah, and actually, I think those two sets of drawings are actually different than the existing drawings and the proposed drawings. Yes, they are. So we're looking at four sets of drawings, none of which are internally or externally consistent. Um, so the, again, for the applicant, we shouldn't be doing all the work. The application needs to be very clear. What are you asking for? What And, and make it clear, make it easy to find, make it easy to understand. Um, Okay. Any other comments? Um, it appears to me that the proposed rear yard is really 19 feet, 9 inches, not 20 feet. Right. And actually, in their zoning analysis, they say it's 30 feet. So there's right. a lot of inconsistencies and errors. And I have the question about how they were calculating their floor area in terms of the garage, mm -hmm. um, whether they had included that in the floor area, and if they had taken any mechanical deduction. Okay. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. 
Item number 25, 115 14BZ, 85 Worth Street, Manhattan. Okay, this is a legalization of a um, PCE. And I didn't have any issues with this, and the community board, board voted to approve. I just had some questions. Maybe the fire department could um, answer them. Uh, were they okay with the exiting from the cellar and the use of the sidewalk hatch as a means of egress out of the cellar? And um, it wasn't clear exactly which parts, to me at least, what, which parts of the cellar were part of the application. Um, and is there signage? And if they could revise the um, facts and findings and note on the drawing to um, array the aisle widths that um, three, feet, three feet is a minimum, um, but that in all cases will comply with applicable codes. Mm -hmm. okay. Item number 26, 122.14 BC, 1318 East 28th Street, Brooklyn. Okay, this is another 73.622 enlargement of an existing single family. Um, and a, again, so the, let's see, the floor area request is essentially a one FAR um, from an existing of 0.68 FAR. Um, and the, there's a, a statement in the statement of facts that the proposal is in character with the neighborhood, but there isn't any data to support that at all. Um, photographs, data, studies, anything. The current land use study is very unclear. It's a, I don't even think the information in the study is, is consistent with what's stated in the application. Um, it doesn't show the property in, in question with respect to the other sites uh, that are the subject of BSA approvals or account for all of the properties that exceed the allowable FAR within the study area. And it actually shows, since if we just rely on what the information is, that on the block itself, there aren't any large homes. So if we worked on the, um, if we worked on the idea of neighborhood character on this block, it would not be in character with the neighborhood. Um, you should indicate also on the photos themselves, some photos were provided of properties that apparently are larger, though it's very unclear what those photographs are. are. Uh, I should indicate on the photos what the floor area is and how they were permitted if they're greater than the as of right. Um, were they subjects of variances or pre-61 without uh, illegal enlargements? Um, the, with respect to the rear yard, um, there already is a one-story garage at the rear, and the proposed extension, which will reduce the size of the rear yard to 20 feet, I believe. Um, well, essentially, that with with the garage and that extension, you effectively eliminate the rear yard. So there needs to be discussion about how that's consistent with neighborhood character, effectively having no rear yard, and what is the impact of both that garage and that very much reduced rear yard on the joining properties to um, left and right and rear. Um, and then, um, oh, then the other one that's very concerning is there's only three feet being provided between the extension at the rear and the garage. So if the garage stays and there's three feet clear, uh, how does the fire department fire, fight a fire in that backyard? So I'd like to hear from the fire department about that issue as well as anything else that they see. Um, then the... A uh, statement of facts describes the attic as a small addition set back, but in fact the drawings show it as being almost the entire length of the building. Um, as we've talked about with other of these applications, the only occupiable area is in the middle. I don't understand why the rest of these, there needs to be an attic for the rest. So that mass should be reduced to be the occupiable area. And again, um, there should be a photo montage to show the effect of the, of that attic addition on the rest of the streetscape to show that it is indeed consistent with neighborhood character. Um, the other thing that's confusing about this application for me is that this is kind of a half house and the house itself is designed to be one pitched sort of gabled roof and this is a half house with its own kind of where the proposal is to sort of add this mass to the roof um, which is very odd so 
uh, if we talk about neighborhood character, you can't talk about half the house in isolation. All the drawings are showing the house in isolation, or that half in isolation. And in fact, there's an impact on the entire house. So I need to see much better studies of that not being, looking very, very odd and really being out of character with the neighborhood. Anybody else? Yep. I agree with you as to the fact that it's a, it is a semi-attached house and what they're proposing really does look out of character with the other half. They do show that one streetscape, the front streetscape view, and they've got to do something to minimize that attic. They either push it back further from the street, especially if they really say that they're only having like a small addition in the attic. There's no need to have it right up front like that. Just, we've had that similarly in other cases with semi-detached homes, and we've always asked them to push it back or minimize it or make the slope more gradual because it really does stick out like a sore thumb on that block. Well, usually they only have the roof pitching in one direction instead of the peaked roof mm -hmm. on a mm. semi-detached house. So right. I think they could just have the, a dormer coming out with a roof pitch to, you know, to coincide with what's already there. The dormer would look much better in this case. Yeah. Maybe they could show us examples in the area if this has been done before um, that sort of give us a little context. And also they've got a flu that it looks like a new flu that, that's popping through the, um, through the new portion of their, um, of their addition. And I'm wondering if that flu needs to actually be higher than they're showing it. I think it's got to be at least three feet above the ridge, the high, your highest ridge line. So even if the ridge is higher at the back, I think he's got to pop it up above that ridge line. So indeed, it might even look stranger. <laughs> so um, I think he's, he's got to take a look at that. OK. Good. Thank you. This concludes the Monday review session for October 20th, 2014.